Welcome back to What's the Point? Today's lesson is from the book of Numbers, chapter 11. And the title of it is Kibroth Hatava, which literally means Graves of Lust. And there's a story that's told many years ago about a group of friends who like to go camping. And um, they'd go for a week in the mountains. It was a beautiful setting. There, uh, the quiet of the woods. It was a stream that ran by, so you had the babbling brook and the sound of the wind blowing through the trees. They had taken this trip before. They had all come to an agreement that the worst part of the camping trip for a week was to have to provide meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for this large troop of people. So they had agreed that they would rotate the responsibilities from year to year. Um, it just so happened that um, a young man and his newlywed wife were the ones that inherited that responsibility in this particular year. And um, the wife was not such a good cook. And this young man had already kind of secretly on a sly told everybody that his wife's cooking wasn't the best and they needed to kind of sort of buck it up and be prepared for that. Well, as it turns out, they made it through the first day, but into the second day they began to grumble and complain. And by the time supper came on the second day, they were all grumbling and complaining to the point that this newlywed woman started to cry. And they all felt bad, so they gathered around her and they tried to comfort and console her and they made their apologies and they begged her to continue to do the cooking for the rest of the week because none of them wanted to do it. And she said, there's one stipulation. I will cook the rest of the week as long as no one complains. But the first person that complains has to do the cooking for the rest of the week. They all agreed. So that evening, she was going to cook beans. And her husband knew she couldn't even cook beans. So she had the pot on the fire and it was cooking away. And he watched for a time when she wasn't near the pot. And he slipped out there and put some salt in the beans. His brother was on the camping trip, too, and he knew she wasn't a good cook. And so when she wasn't looking, he went and he put some salt in the beans. And one after the other, five more people secretly went and added salt to the pot. Well, by the time supper time came, the first person to take a bite wrinkled up their face and said, Oh, my Lord, these beans are salty. And he looked at the cook and saw the look on her face and knew that he was about to become the cook for the rest of the week. So very quickly he covered himself and said, they're just the way I like them. Well, the story illustrates several things, but most important, the similarity in it is this. Complaining is contagious, and it always leads to more problems and sometimes disaster than any of us want to have. The fact of the matter is in this segment of Scripture, God has taken the people out of Egypt. It was a horrible place for them. It was a slave factory. He put them on the road to Canaan, which was a land where there would be ample uh, opportunity for them, provision for a fru fruitful future. And uh, he had given them everything they really needed in life. And he had forgiven them even of their impatience that led to them worshiping a false god or a golden calf. He had provided supernatural leadership through uh, Moses, and he had, had given them visible manifestations of his presence and his spirit to reassure them and give them comfort so that they knew that he was with them. They had just celebrated their first Passover, which is a reflection on their deliverance from the death angel in Egypt. All the fanfare, it was just a wonderful experience, and it seemed like the people were ready once and for all to trust in God as they were led on their journey. However, the very first verse of chapter 11 says, the people were soon complaining about their misfortunes, and the Lord heard them. Well, the Lord's response in this situation was very swift. It was very quick and to the point. He sent fire. The Bible says he sent his fire among the people, and they began to die. And uh, the fire went on the outskirts of the camp. If you can just imagine two million people in camp. And uh, the fire began on the outside and began to come inward, and the people cried out to Moses. And Moses prayed. And God stopped the fire. And uh, you would think, well, that would be enough for it because many had died and that memory was fresh in their minds. But the scripture goes on to say that there was this mixed multitude among them that began to complain and it added to the discomfort of the people of God. The mixed multitude were people who had come out of Egypt either 
Hebrew men had married Egyptian women, or Egyptian women had married, or vice versa. Um, or it was people who had seen God at work among the Hebrew people and uh, saw all the miracles and, and wanted to be a part of it and said, include us in this promise that God's given to you. But they were a mixed multitude that were complaining because of the things that they um, remembered from Egypt. And uh, it the scripture says it added to the discomfort of God's people so they too began to complain and they were wishing for the fish and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the cucumbers of Egypt they complained about the manna that God had given to them and you have to remember this that God gave them the manna it was made daily into different cakes they would go out and harvest it they would uh, mix oils and different things with it so that it, it, it had a little bit of a variety to it but it was eaten at every meal the important part about it, it was nutritious and it met all their health needs. They weren't any sick among them. They didn't have any intestinal digestive problems. But here they go. Moses walks among the camp and he sees the Hebrew people standing around their tent doors weeping, is what the scripture says. And they were weeping for the food of Egypt. Now, this displeased Moses greatly. And the Bible says it made God angry. And Moses was so discouraged with the situation that he asked God why he was picking on him. He had a Charlie Brown moment. You know, why is everybody always picking on me? Well, we all have those, I guess, sometimes. But he goes on to say, Am I the father that I take care of them like babies? How am I supposed to get meat when there are so many of them? Oh, God, why don't you just kill me now? That would be the merciful thing to do. Well, God responds. He tells Moses to get 70 elders from the people and bring them to him. And Moses did exactly what the Lord commanded him to do. And uh, God brought his spirit down. And they did share the load. But it, it's important to note that the scripture says God took a portion of the spiritual power and authority from Moses and gave it to them. And you're going to see later in the study of the Word of God how that affects Moses' own ability to lead and maintain his own self-control. If you read the chapter, you know what God says next. He says, I'm going to give the people meat, all right. I'm going to give them meat, not just for a day or for a week, or f but for a whole month. And there'll be so much that they're going to vomit it out of their noses. Yuck, yuck, and more yuck is all I can say. Well, Moses couldn't believe it either. He says, Lord, how in the world are you going to give meat to 600,000 men, let alone all the women and children? And God's response to him is something I just love. Listen to what God says. He says, when did I become weak? And you all know that we're going through a crisis as a nation right now, and it seems pretty bleak, but I want to remind you, God hasn't become weak. I can just about hear him say, when I start to be concerned and worry about it, child, when did I become weak? You're going to see whether or not my word comes true. So God sends his cloud down on the 70, and the word of God says they all began to prophesy. The people were so astonished around them that Joshua, who later becomes the leader of the nation, runs to Moses and says, what are we going to do all about this? And Moses' response is, I wish to God that everybody would have the Spirit of God. And I say amen to that. And you know, Pentecost is a beautiful part of our lives. Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon all men. And those who would receive Christ can receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And this should be our prayer for ourselves and for the people around us. So then God sent a wind that brought quail from the sea, and they began to fall all over the place. Now, this is interesting. They were flying about three feet off the ground. One translation says the people spent the day and the night batting quail, and the least of them gathered ten homers. Well, some people say that was the first baseball game that was ever played, and it was played in the Word of God. Well, I guess I better get back to the story. Um, the fact of the matter is um, the people began to eat the meat, and God's anger was stirred against them so that they died with the meat between their teeth. In other words, God sent a plague that killed large numbers of them. And the place is called Gebroth Hatava, or Graves of Lust. Because many of them died there because they lusted for meat. And they lusted for the things that they had come out of that God had delivered them from in Egypt. You know, a friend of mine told me his father caught him smoking a cigarette that had been given to him by a schoolmate. And his father asked him if he wanted to be a smoker. And he told his dad, I think it's pretty cool. So his dad said, okay, let's go to the store and buy you a pack of cigarettes. After they bought the pack, his dad drove to the river. And he walked over to a park bench that had been placed there for people to sit on. 
his dad handed him the pack and a lighter and said, go ahead, light one up. Oh, well, boy, lit it up. But he didn't drag it into his lungs. You see, he was a novice. His dad said, son, if you want to really be a man, and you want to be a man about this, you got to drag it deep into your lungs. So he did. Well, he says he coughed his way through that first cigarette, and as soon as he got done with it, he thought, oh, my gosh, we're done. Let's get out of here. His dad handed him another one and said, smoke this, and then another one that said, smoke this, and then another one smoked this, and you could probably guess he didn't make it through the whole pack because he was puking up his guts. He said he had a terrible headache. He was dizzy. He couldn't hardly stand up on his own. His dad said, well, now, son, do you still want to smoke? And he said, no, Dad, I've had enough. Well, enough is enough, and I will tell you this. The things that we long for are not worth it. You got to understand that. The things that we long for are not worth it. Our memories, like the memories of the people of, of Israel, were twisted. They weren't correct. Our memories aren't correct. We long for things that aren't worth it. And we often do that ourselves. You know, the good old days were not really so good. They were old, but they're, they weren't that good. Those people had it bad in Egypt. It was a terrible place for them. God had given them everything they needed to make the next step on the journey. The wilderness wasn't their destination. They had lost sight of the mark of their high calling of God. So let's summarize it this way. What's the point? A lack of gratitude by those mixed with the world's point of view caused them to grumble and complain. Complaining was contagious to the point that it got on God's nerves and Moses, too, lost his vision for the future. See, even a man of God with the power of the Holy Spirit began to lose respect of the Lord and complain his burden was too much rather than praise God for his presence in the time of trouble. In the end, many of those sojourners died in the wilderness because of their lust born of discontent. Moses lost his full portion of the Holy Spirit because of his discouragement. And later we're going to see him make poor choices that will actually keep him from going into the promised land. The lesson has to be applied to our lives too. Think how many families have been destroyed by lust. Think how many lives have been destroyed by addictions. Think about how many families have been buried in graves of lust. Psalm 106.14 describes our world today. It says they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. He gave them their request but sent lameness to their souls. Our nation has leanness of the soul, y'all. Oh, that people would be like King David who repented of his many sins and wrote Psalm 42.1, As the heart pants for the water brook, so pants my soul after thee, O God. There lies the cure for the disappointment and the lust. Let's have the mind of David as he pens Psalm 42.2, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? If you're like Moses and you feel you're at the end of the rope, he basically said, that's it, I quit. Do as he did. He did not quit. He turned to God and God sent his spirit to work on his behalf. God has not changed. He would help you too. George Beverly Shea used to sing this great old song. Acres of diamonds, mountains of gold, rivers of silver, jewels untold. All these together couldn't buy you or me peace where we're sleeping or a conscience that's free. A heart that's contented or a satisfied mind. These are the treasures that money can't buy. But if you have Jesus, there's more wealth in your soul than acres of diamonds or mountains of gold. There's a generation who doesn't know who George Beverly Shea is, and there's a generation that don't know what it's like to have the peace of God. I ask you today, wouldn't you rather have Jesus and have more wealth in your soul? than acres of diamonds and mountains of gold. I say again to you, the things that we lust for are not worth it. Go after God, go with God, and He'll go with you. Have a blessed day in the Lord as you ponder these truths.